And again, can we grab our Bible and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You got it? Look at the first two words in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Notice it says, furthermore, then. What he means by that is, as for the rest, here's what I have to say. Really, those two words mark an introduction of a new subject that Paul is going to talk about. Remember I said when we did the introduction to this book of First Thessalonians that the first three chapters are more personal. And chapters four and five, the last two chapters, are practical. Well, now we turn to the practical part of this letter to the church there in Thessalonia. And I think what he begins with when he says, I exhort you, brethren, by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, you would abound more and more. I think what he's doing in these first 12 verses is actually linking his prayer wish for them that we looked at the last time we opened this book. Look at chapter 3, just back up to chapter 3. And look at Paul's prayer for them in verses 12 and 13. Got your Bible? Look at uh, verses 12 and 13 of chapter 3. He says, And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you, to the end, that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. That's his prayer wish that he ends that third chapter with. And he is linking that prayer with what he has to say in the first 12 verses. And that is simply this, that these people who are revealing really brotherly love for one another, that that, 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 uh, that living brotherly love would grow and it would grow mutually among them to the point that it would be unable to keep it contained, keep it under cover, and that it would overflow and spread to everyone. I like the way he says it in that first verse of chapter four. You've received how you ought to walk or conduct your Christian life which is to please God, you've done that, but he says, you should do it more. You should abound more and more. I want, it to, I want your love for one another to increase. I want it to grow. I want it to grow to the point where you can't keep it under wraps, that it just overflows and spreads, not only among yourselves, but among everyone in your city, in your neighborhood, in your area. How does that happen? Well, he's going to tell us here, it's by cooperating with the Holy Spirit to develop an inner stability that will express itself in really a selflessness. You know what godliness is? <laughs> godliness is selflessness. It's not thinking of yourself at all. It's thinking about what pleases God. A godliness, he says, when he prays for them in verse 13, that is unblameable. In other words, can't be censored. We hear a lot about censorship nowadays. Well, what Paul says, I'm praying that your love for one another will be so great, so mutual, that no one can censor it that no one can censor you for not having it because you need to be prepared. He says in the last uh, phrase of verse 13 of chapter uh, 3, you need to be prepared because Jesus is going to return 
and he's going to return with the saints. And that can happen anytime. You know, Jesus could come back before I finish this message. Think about that. You realize that? It's a truth. And as uh, Brother Craig said in his uh, portion this morning, we need to live by prophetic truth, allowing it to have an impact upon us. Remember what Jesus said, men don't live by bread alone, but live by every word that proceeded out of the mouth. of You know what he means by that? He means it's not good enough to read your Bible. It's not good enough to just know your Bible. It's not good enough just to study your Bible. He says men are to live by the word of God. It has to be applied in daily life. And so I want to share with you in these 12 verses, really what Paul says the goal of Christian living is all about. If I would ask you, what's the goal of living the Christian life? What's the goal? Well, he tells us in the first verse. Did you notice it? Can you find the goal of Christian living in verse 1? Three words. To please God. To please God. That's the goal of the Christian life, to please God. Not to please me, but to please him. Not to please self, but to please our Savior. So let's pause a moment and see then how we can live and reach that goal of pleasing God. Heavenly Father, I'm grateful to be here this morning, back with your people here at Bethel. And I'm grateful, Lord, that you are in our midst and that you want to accomplish your purpose. May you be pleased to reveal Jesus and his truth to us. We pray for that anointing from the Holy One that unction of the Holy Spirit himself upon both your messenger as well as the listener, that there might be a connection with you and what it is that you have to say to each person. So make it personal, make it real, make it powerful for your glory again and not for us so that you're pleased, Lord, our goal today and every day as believers, is to please you. So may you be pleased today as we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. The first eight verses, again, we've read this, and I think that you've caught the fact that uh, the first thing that pleases God is that believers live morally. That believers live morally pure, that we live purely. The whole Christian life ought to be lived in sexual purity. This is what he's talking about in these verses. The Lord deals with the most important areas and all the areas of our life. Look at how he puts it here. He says uh, in verse 1, how you ought to walk. And walk is just a... It's just a picture of what the Christian life is. It's a walk. Sometimes it's called a race. But here it's called a walk. A walk is a step-by-step -step process. A walk is, is, uh, uh, is it's symbolic here of how you conduct your life. So you conduct your life to please God. He says you ought to walk that way. The word ought speaks of an obligation that we have. We owe a debt to God. It is a priority obligation that we have to live lives that are pleasing to God. In other words, to surrender all the parts of our life to God because you know what? He's the owner of them. He's going to talk about moral purity in these verses. When you Are you with me? I want you to be focused, and I want you to hang with me for just a few minutes, and we'll then be able to eat. Won't that be good? 
Listen to me. When we talk about moral purity, we're talking about the human body. If you're a believer, your body doesn't belong to you. And really, an unbeliever's body really doesn't belong to them either because they didn't come up with it. They're a creation of God. And your body as a believer especially belongs to God, as Paul says, because you have been purchased at a high cost. You can't put a dollar amount on it. You've been purchased with nothing less than the very life of Christ himself. He gave his body for your body. He shed his blood so that he could uh, pay the price to redeem your body out of slavery to sin. So we ought, we ought to live morally pure lives because our, our bodies don't belong to us. They're to be the instrument, they're to be the vehicle, they're to be the way that we glorify God on this earth. You can't live on this earth without a body. That's why God gave us bodies. We're earthly people. And he wants us to live out our earthly life in this body in a way that pleases him. And the way that he's pleased is that we live morally pure. You see, here's what happened. When you got saved, not only were you purchased as God's special possession, special treasure through the life and shed blood of the Lord Jesus, but also at that moment, the Holy Spirit of God invaded your life and your life was dramatically transformed. A total shift in your life took place. You know what it was? Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that your life has been completely dramatically transformed in that you no longer live for yourselves, but you live for him. You no longer live for self, but you live for Jesus. Remember that. Your body's not yours, and the pursuits of your life are for him and not yourself, and will never arrive at perfection on this side of glory. But we can't coast either. We can't rest upon our laurels. We can't be satisfied. You and I can never be satisfied with our current level of spiritual uh, achievement. Don't ever be satisfied with where you are on the spiritual plane. Always pursuing that prize, which is Christ, that mark, which is Christ, pursuing him. This is what it means to please God with your life, to live morally. Look at what he says in verse 3. This is the will of God, okay? Sometimes we're confused. Oh, what's God's will in this matter? Well, here's something we should never be confused about. The will of God is your sanctification. One part of God's will for the believer is holiness. That's what the word sanctification, another word for that is holiness. It literally means to be set apart. When he uses that term here, what he's saying is God's will is that believing lives would be passing through this process in which they would have a growing holiness in their life that's evident, that they would have a growing sense of being set apart to God as his unique possession, that they would have a growing evidence of his presence in their life, which would be revealed in victory over sinful living and selfish living. That's what sanctification, living morally, it's God's will. And he gets more specific. He says in the second part of verse 3 that you should abstain or stay away from fornication. 
Okay. Here, he's going to uh, give us some application now. Specifically, he says, you should live a Christian life. If you want to please God, then your Christian life has to be a absolutely sexually pure. You know, think about this. If sex wasn't a pleasurable act, we would immediately reduce crime. We'd end divorce. We would eliminate teen pregnancy. We would stop pornography. But if it wasn't pleasurable, we would forfeit a very special part of God's creation. God made human beings male and female, period. He made them male and female so that they could have this very special relationship in the bounds of marriage. And what he's saying here in that third verse, when he says, it's my will that you be set apart to me, away from sin and selfishness, and avoid fornication, what he's saying is, we as believers all need to learn to handle our sexual desires properly. That is God's way, the biblical way. He says that you abstain. See that word abstain? Again, it means to keep away from sexual immorality, sexual impurity. Stay away from it. Keep away from, he says, fornication. Now, the word fornication, you need to understand this. So I want you to stay with me. The word fornication is like an umbrella term for all illicit sex. The word fornication, it, it covers premarital sex. It covers extramarital sex like adultery or prostitution. Uh, it, it, uh, it, it covers pornography. It, it covers uh, anything, any self-pleasure that you might, uh, that you might uh, give to yourself sexually. And it, uh, it even pertains to homosexuality. That's a big word, fornication. And what the Bible says, if you're going to live to please God, you have to be morally pure. And if you're morally pure, then you are going to keep away from fornication. All forms of sexual impurity that you can think of. Now, I should say this. If you've not avoided it, and, you know, it's really difficult because we live in a hyper-sexualized culture. We live in a culture, that's all they want to talk about. That's the only thing that draws the crowds, right? Because of the act of pleasure that's, con that's connected with it. I understand that. But as a result, it's really difficult to live sexually pure. And I just want to say this to you. If you have failed to live in sexual purity in the past, there's forgiveness. If you are currently not living a sexually pure life and involved in any form of fornication, you can have a new start. You can be delivered. You can be forgiven and you can be delivered. And I want you to know that. Because I want you to have hope. But it all begins with a right understanding. If you're going to please God, moral purity is a must. And uh, in order to be morally pure, there has to be that avoidance. Abstain, he says, from all forms of fornication. How do you do that? Look at verses 4 and 5 that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and holiness, being your body set apart to God, in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, that is, lustful passion, just unrestrained lust, that you just feel it and so you do it. He says, not in the lust of concupiscence, 
even as the nations that are pagan that don't know God. You, you have to remember, this city where this church is located, Thessalonia, was a port city. They had people coming in and out all the time looking for a one-night stand, you might say. But also, you have to realize that in this culture, this was totally acceptable because uh, their Greek and Roman mythology and, uh, and religion involved prostitution and homosexuality. It was part of their religious cult. It was totally acceptable. You could go to a, to a, a pagan temple and uh, participate in sexual immorality, and that was religion. So this is why he's writing this stuff. But, you know, we never change. Human nature never changes. And I like the way the Bible gets down to where the rubber hits the road and where we, the nitty-gritty of our daily life. What is he saying in verses 4 and 5 in this application? You have to avoid it, but also to achieve it, you have to learn to control your own body. That's what he means when he says, you should know how to possess your vessel, that's your body, in holiness. You got to learn how to control your bodily desires and not let your body's desires control you so that you become a slave to lust that is raging in you because of hormones and because, as I said a moment ago, of the sexualized culture that is all around you, like the nations and like the pagans and like the unbelievers whose gods are like them, filled with unrestrained passion and lust. But you're not them. You're God's possession, remember? He says, and you ought to please God in verse 1, and not be like the Gentiles, verse 5, which don't know God. <laughs> you know God. You belong to him. And so you're God's possession. You want to know how to, how to achieve moral purity? Stay tuned. In the PM service, I'm going to show you how to do it. How to be pure. But just let me say this. Moral purity is the result of you surrendering to the God that you know. You surrendering to God as his possession. Let him possess you, body, soul, and spirit. And then trusting the Holy Spirit of God to enable you to overcome the temptations to impurity, to fornication. Look at what he says in verse 6. That no man, he, he's, that, that, uh, he's speaking to believers, that no brother in Christ, you might say, go beyond and defraud his brother in any manner, because the Lord is the avenger of all such. This is sexual immorality that becomes abuse. And taking advantage, and here it's in the context of brothers and sisters in the Lord. You know, there's a lot of, you, it, you may not realize it, maybe you do. There's a lot of sexual immorality that goes on in the church. You know, there are some churches, and, and uh, it doesn't have to be a big church. It can be a small church like this. But uh, often in bigger congregations, uh, men go to larger churches in order to look for women. And sometimes women go to larger churches in order to have a more choice of, of, of a man. And I understand that. I understand that totally. But folks, here is a warning that believers, because they are discontent and they want something badly, they're discontent and they want more maybe. They take advantage of another brother or sister in the Lord in a sexual way. This kind of stuff goes on. Sad to say, it even happens with a pastor and uh, a, another 
woman in the church sometimes. No one is exempt from this temptation. If we're human beings, we all have these hormones and these drives, and this is the way God created us, but we have to control. And we need to surrender our bodies and our lives to God and depend upon him to enable us to live pure morally. And don't abuse, take advantage of Christian brothers and sisters. Be careful. They just uh, I, I have no one in mind, but be careful about your relationships here in this local church with uh, the opposite sex. Be careful about that. Because you don't want to put yourself in any knowing temptation. He says in, in that sixth verse that when we are not, when we are sexually immoral in the church with a brother or sister, we're taking advantage of them. We're abusing them. You think about it. How is it abuse? Well, it hurts God. Certainly doesn't please him. It hurts him. It also, you hurt yourself. And thirdly, you hurt your brother or sister. Now, isn't it interesting that he says in uh, the, the ninth verse, but as touching brotherly love, you don't need that I write to you, for you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. You know what? It, here's what I want to say. The most loving thing that you can do to another brother or sister in a local church, or in any setting for that matter, is to respect them sexually and to abstain from immorality. When we overstep those boundaries, we defraud that brother. We hurt that brother or sister in the Lord. We take advantage of them selfishly for what we can get out of it. And that's not love. Love in the Bible is selfless. It's not selfish. And you can, you can say all the right things, and you can, you can be convinced that this is true love, but I'm telling you, if it's outside of the boundaries of marriage, it's lust. And let's call it what it is. It's sin. fornication, something we're supposed to avoid. So the key really here in clean living morally in a local church is love the brethren in the biblical sense. Love them with the love of Christ, that you're willing to sacrifice yourself in order for them to be pure, in order for them to be right with God. You would not selfishly take advantage of them. More to follow in the afternoon. I hope I intrigued you by that. No, seriously, this is an important subject that I don't speak much on. If it comes up in the Bible, I'll speak on it. But I don't speak on it much. I'm uncomfortable. It's awkward speaking about this. But God, he doesn't care. He speaks on it because he knows what we're made of. He knows this is a big problem in our lives. You young men and you young women and us older guys, you know what? I thought when I was a young man that when I got married, uh, that problem would, would, would dissipate. It doesn't. It's not the way we're made. Marriage is supposed to help, and it does. But it's not the total answer. We still need to learn how to control our bodies and our desires. Now, I understand pornography is one of the biggest ways that uh, men commit fornication without actually going through an act. And young men and, and middle-aged men and older men, and you know what? I'm going to talk about that in the afternoon. Even women are into it now. Pornography. You're sitting in your heart. You're committing fornication in your heart. You're to avoid it, according to these verses. And uh, you are also to achieve holiness and not abuse. 
let's look at the next uh, couple of verses because here's the motivation that he gives us for moral purity. You ready for it? In verse six, he says, the Lord is the avenger of all such. As we have forewarned you and testified, God's not called us to uncleanness, but to holiness. He, therefore, that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who has also given unto us his Holy Spirit. <clears throat> no matter what we have been involved in, no matter what we have done as far as sexual immorality and impurity is concerned, there's forgiveness. There's always forgiveness. But I'm telling you, painful results continue. And to ignore the warning he tells us in these verses I've just read is to really turn your back on God. To ignore the warnings and keep doing whatever area of fornication you're involved in, whatever area of, of immorality sexually that you're involved in is to, if you ignore the warning, you're turning your back on God. So don't fool yourself into thinking that you're spiritual if you are ignoring what God says here, you're not. You're rejecting God. You're not just, you're, when you reject the word of God, you reject God himself. So there is a, 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 a level of God rejection if you are ignoring what the Bible says here on this subject. Is that clear enough? And as a result, he says in verse 8, you also, you're forfeiting the Holy Spirit's power that was given to you. You're forfeiting the Holy Spirit's power. You can't be a Holy Spirit-filled Christian and be dabbling in fornication, any area of it. Can't be. Not a Spirit-filled. You can't have God's power and blessing on your life. Here's the second thing to please God. Not only live morally or purely, but in verses 9 to 12, live responsibly. How do you do that? Well, verse 9, stay loving. And verses 11 and 12, keep working. Stay loving and keep working. That's how you live responsibly. In fact, in the ninth verse and the, and the tenth verse, He's talking about being brotherly in your love. He says, but as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for you yourselves are taught of God to love one another, and indeed you do. This, you know what? The Thessalonian church was an amazing church. Think of the horrible culture that they uh, were saved out of, and yet they really are commendable. Their witness is spreading out, not only in that area of Greece called Macedonia, but throughout the whole area, there, there's ripple effects of their testimony. And now he's commending them, and he's saying, you love one another. Uh, but he says in verse 10, do more. <laughs> Let it increase more and more. It kind of is what he said in verse 1, and he repeats in verse 10, you guys are doing a good job, but it's not enough. Let it increase, let it grow, let it abound, let it overflow its banks as, a, as a, 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 a river with rising water. Let it to over, love more. Keep an attitude toward others that is warm and gracious. Watch your words to one another. You know, I grew up in the 60s and the 70s. And that was a time where there was a particular culture called the hippie culture. The popular idea of the hippie culture was you have to find yourself. And so people were, young people were traveling all over the globe trying to find themselves. Maybe they'd go to India and check out uh, Hinduism or or Buddhism, and they were trying to find themselves, or they would take a trip on LSD in order to alter their state of consciousness so they could find themselves. 
Well, despite the futility of young people seeking to find themselves, God used that inner emptiness to reveal himself to many of those young people through a movement called the Jesus Movement. I think there was a a, uh, a movie made by Greg Laurie ab- about that. Many of them, thousands of hippies came to know Jesus as their savior as a result of that emptiness of self-seeking. You know what? In the 80s, sadly, in the 80s, this self-focus sneaked into American Christianity And it was in the guise of a very destructive and I think demonic doctrine called self-esteem. And the idea of self-esteem was this, that you can't love other people. And, you know, Christians are supposed to love others, right? You can't love other people unless you really love yourself. The doctrine of self-esteem. That's the opposite of what the Bible says. The New Testament has a leading emphasis that we're not to love ourselves, but we're to love others. Let me just quickly read this. Here's uh, Philippians 2. If there be any consolation, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, fulfill my joy that you be like-minded, have the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, not self-esteem, but in lowliness of mind, let each, listen to this, esteem other better than themselves. Don't look on your own things, but look how you can bless other people, is what Paul's saying. Don't esteem yourself, esteem others better than yourself. Well, that's the basis of this truth of loving the brethren. You know, I think it was C.S. Lewis and he was saying it in the, in the context of husband, wife, and marriage, but I want to apply it this way, and, and that's this, that uh, if you love God the most, you'll love others more. Repeat that. If you love God the most, you'll love one another more. And that's what Paul is calling them to do in verse 10, that uh, you love your brethren, but I want it to increase more and more. Well, love God the most, and you'll love more and more. When you make God the focus of your love, automatically you'll start to love others more than you ever have before. He's basically saying, Don't live by your feelings. Don't act on your feelings, but rather choose to draw on God's love, which is his ability to enable you to love. All right? So live responsibly, that is brotherly, with love. And then look at verses 11 and 12, and we'll be done. Study to be quiet. (laughs) Live a quiet life. I don't think there's a whole lot of people sitting here that live quiet lives. Certainly not in New York City. He says, study to live quietly. You know, Paul says, pray for your leaders that you might live a quiet and peaceable life. We should choose to live quiet lives. Not hectic. Not wild but quiet lives because it's a quiet life that can spend time with the Lord. It's a quiet life that takes time out to be in God's presence. So learn, he says, to live a quiet life. (laughs) And I like what he says, to do your own business. In other words, M-Y-O-B. Mind your own business. Stop sticking your nose in everyone else's business. Focus on what your responsibility is. Live responsibly by taking care of your personal responsibilities and not trying to micromanage everyone else's. 
live responsibly. And then be diligent. Look at what he says. Work with your own hands as we commanded you that you might walk honestly toward them without that lost people might see that you have gainful employment, that you're not moochers, that you're not seeking to live off other people as a parasite, that you would walk honestly toward them without that you would have lack of nothing. He's saying be diligent. Keep busy. Live a quiet life, but keep busy with profitable work that you can support yourself so you don't have to depend upon others to support you, so that you don't have that self-pity with a victim mentality that sucks everything out of everyone around you. Jesus said it this way in a parable, occupy till I come. Occupy till I come. And it's interesting that in the last few verses, we're not going to go through verses 13 to 18, but now he, he'll talk, he'll change the subject, and he'll talk about what we would call the rapture. These Thessalonians were living foolish lives. That's why he says what he does in verses 11 and 12. This is an area of foolishness in their life because they misunderstood the coming of Jesus, the return of Jesus. It really wasn't their fault. Uh, they thought they were doing the right thing. What they were doing was they were quitting their jobs and they were stopping working because they believed that Jesus was going to come and they wanted to be ready for it. They didn't think they needed to work anymore. So in that area, these Thessalonians were living foolishly because their stress was on Jesus' coming. Did you know that in 1846, there was a man named William Miller who was a religious leader, and he predicted that Jesus would come a certain day and a certain hour. Kind of reminds me of Harold Camping. You remember Harold Camping? I think he's with the Lord. I don't know that for sure. I think he's with the Lord. But he predicted that Jesus was going to come back a couple of times. And, of course, he was proved wrong. Well, Miller did that back in the mid-1800s. And a group of his followers, they all quit their jobs. And I think some of the campingites quit their jobs because they believed him and suffered great financial loss. They dissolved their bank accounts. Well, that's what uh, Miller did. Uh, the, the people that followed him, they quit their jobs, they sold all the possessions, and they all went up with Miller on top of a hill to wait for Jesus to appear. Now, they had tremendous expectation. Jesus didn't show up. And so they looked ridiculous. And that's what he's saying to them here in verse 12. You're going to look ridiculous in the eyes of lost people. They're not going to want anything to do with your Jesus if they see what a fool you've been. And so stay busy. Stay occupied with your daily life. Don't become a moocher and uh, lose the respect of the world. God wants believers to please him by living morally and by living responsibly. But you and I can't achieve that ourselves. And I've said this. And here's the good news that I'm closing with. And that is this. You can depend upon God. You can depend upon the Holy Spirit of God in you. And he will supply you the ability to live both morally and responsibly. Some of us are living proof of that. The only way we've been able to accomplish this was because the Holy Spirit of God in us has enabled us to do that. The Word of God, the Holy Spirit has taken the Word of God and has transformed our lives and continues to do so. And we're still going through this process of growth and we're increasing more and more as we do so in these areas of living morally and living responsibly. You know, 
people seem to in America live with the future retirement in view. That's not living responsibly. That's the American dream. That's not Bible. There's no such thing as that in the Bible. Now, don't misunderstand me. You can become very busy in the work of the Lord uh, if you take retirement, as they call it here, in this country. You don't, that doesn't mean that you just go and enjoy, you know, doing nothing. But it means that you inv now you have an opportunity, perhaps, to invest your life in the things of the Lord like you never had before. Think about that. Because he says, study to be quiet. Live a quiet life. And busy yourself by supporting yourself and being able to bless others.